Miss Guilford was a highly qualified nursing sister. She was reportedly suffocated, stabbed and bashed with a hammer in the early hours of Friday morning. Today, authorities confirmed that arrested two of her colleagues and charged them with murder. The two nurses, Deborah Perry and Lucille McLaughlin, were apparently caught while trying to use Miss Guilford's credit cards. The two British nurses say they were tricked into confessing and are innocent. Guilty or innocent, the brutal murder of Yvonne Guilford three years ago has never been fully resolved. Lucille McLaughlin and Deborah Parry never stopped proclaiming their innocence and retracted their confessions. But both nurses were found guilty by a Saudi court. Deborah Parry was found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. Lucille McLaughlin was given a sentence of eight years and 500 lashes for being an accessory to the murder. But 18 months later, the two nurses were freed by the clemency of the King of Saudi Arabia and returned home to the UK. Deborah Parry and Lucille McLaughlin arrived at London's Gatwick Airport just before 3 p.m. Australian time. It ended a seven-hour flight to freedom, but back to intense controversy. Even as the nurses' lawyers were broadcasting live, authorities were issuing a warrant for McLaughlin's arrest. This warrant was for a charge of theft. Before she went to Saudi Arabia, Lucille McLaughlin had been arrested for stealing and using a bank card in her hometown of Dundee. Now this case was coming to court. Lucille contacted us. She couldn't talk about the Dundee case, but she wanted to put her side of the events in Saudi. It would be her first extensive television interview. We reached an agreement with her. She could tell her story, but we would then investigate it. Her story starts here. In April of 96, I'd been accused and charged with theft in Dundee here. About three or four weeks later, I'd lost my job, uh, so I was unemployed. Uh, I'd got temporary work in a nursing home in Dundee. The debts were piling up. I was just getting into a mess financially. Uh, working abroad, you know, the prospect of a tax-free salary just seemed, you know, too good to be true. And it certainly would have solved a lot of my problems, even obtaining a one-year contract out there. And it was a new start. One of the first people I met, you know, in the hospital was Yvonne, Yvonne Guilford. She was working on the same ward as me. She was very friendly, she was very sensible, she was very down to earth. If you're in trouble of any kind, Yvonne would be there to help you. That was just her nature. Anybody who was in trouble or needed anything, they, if they went to Yvonne, she would help them, money or anything. She lent it because salaries were being held up. She had a bank account here, and because she had spare cash, she would lend it quite freely. Yvonne Guilford befriended another British nurse, Deborah Parry, who started work at the King Fahd Hospital in Dharan at the same time as Lucille McLaughlin. There were later to be allegations that the three women were involved in a lesbian relationship. Is it con conceivable that Debbie and Yvonne could have had a lesbian relationship? Well, anything's conceivable. It's conceivable me and Yvonne were having a lesbian relationship, you know, but it's not true. Yvonne certainly, and, and Debbie also for that matter, never ever gave me any inclination that they were having a sexual relationship in any way. They were very close. But, you know, when you're away from home uh, and you meet someone and you're friends with them, it's quite normal to be like that. It's not an unusual thing to happen, I don't think. The hospital, a self-contained compound 40 minutes drive from the city, employs medical staff from many countries. Another nurse from Australia also linked up with Lucille. Lucy and I met and uh, we were very similar in personalities. We both had, a, 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 that struck me initially and plus we both were smoking. So that was easier to sit around another smoker than a non-smoker. Um, she, ha she had a very lively personality. She was very funny, very witty. The 11th of December, 1996. The two British nurses had been working at the King Fahd Hospital for six weeks. 
Deborah Parry claims she spent that evening in her room and went to bed early. Lucille McLaughlin finished her hospital shift at seven and returned to her apartment in the female nurses' quarters. About nine, there was a, you know, my bell went on my door and it was Yvonne and she said she'd locked herself out. Now, that's the first time, I had a spare key for Yvonne's apartment, and that's the first time I'm aware that Yvonne had, had done anything like that. And I made a joke to her, that she was getting old and senile, or just being very, you know, just a laugh between the two of us. <clears throat> so I gave her the key, and she says, you want to come down? And I says, oh yeah, okay then, I wasn't doing anything. So I went down, and we watched most of a film, I think it was Terms of Endearment we watched, a Jack Nicholson film. And she was fine and she was in good spirits and I uh, left about, I think about 10.30, something like that. I left her apartment and she was fine and, and certainly very much alive when I left her. Yvonne Guilford was due to start work at 7 o'clock the next morning. I was contacted by the nursing administrator on duty that morning. I'm unsure about the time but I think it may have been about 7.20 to go down and wake Yvonne because she was supposed to be on duty and she hadn't arrived for work. So I went down and rang her bell and called her name but there was no response. I was quite sure that she possibly had just woken up and I'd possibly just missed her. So I contacted the nursing administrator and she, she said, no, no, I, I'm very concerned. Later, the nursing administrator, Deslin Marks, called Lucille McLaughlin. I got a phone call from Deslin asking me if I'd saw Yvonne or heard from Yvonne and I said to her, well, yeah, I saw her last night. You know, I didn't make any secret of the fact I'd been in Yvonne's apartment. And she said, was she okay? And I said, well, yeah, she was fine. She's at work. And she said, no, she's not. She's not turned up. And I thought, something's up. Lucille went across to Yvonne's apartment building. I remember standing with Karla and Pozlowska and just... I heard somebody was shouting, damn, damn. And I was like that, you know, what's that, what's that? I didn't really, I knew hardly any Arabic by that time and Karla and Pozlowska said, that's blood. There was, there was lots, of, it was just chaos. There was policemen and nurses and people watching and... We didn't even know if she was dead or then. We were asking, I mean, I did. I think somebody said, you kept asking if she was dead. I, I did. The, the, somebody shouting blood is in the apartment. I was asking if she was, she alive. She, what's happening? You know what I mean? Lucy was very, very upset. She got chronic diarrhea, so she was constantly in the bathroom. She was chain smoking, cigarette after cigarette, and she could not sit down. By 10 a.m., Yvonne Guilford had been officially pronounced dead. People said you were saying dead. Is she dead? Uh, you I weren't did ask. Say, you weren't saying murdered. No, no, nobody. I found out that Yvonne was mur murdered. There was all these rumours in the afternoon, and I actually found out that Yvonne had definitely been murdered. I think about 4 p.m. that afternoon. Lucille McLaughlin had told the Daran police she'd been with Yvonne Guilford the evening before her death. By 6 p.m. on the day of the murder, she was taken to the police station for questioning. I just arrived in Saudi, things had gone great. Theft allegation in Scotland, which basically I'm <laughs> in Saudi to try and get myself sorted out, you know, because of that. And here I am three months later, sitting in a police station, and one of my colleagues has been murdered. So yeah, I was, I was frightened. I mean, I was. People might say, Lucy appeared to be unduly frightened and looking back on it with hindsight, maybe that is true. I would accept that. But I was terrified of them finding out about the theft allegation in Scotland and when I was. And I know that's a very selfish thing to say when a friend of yours has been murdered. But that, if I'm being very honest, I was frightened that they were going to find out about that. I was thinking of everything, there was all different things going through my head, you know, what happened to Yvonne? I was in her apartment the night before. I had this, I never, there was no secret, I did have a spare key for her apartment. You know, and the longer things were going on, the more I was panicking and... You know, I was, I was terrified, I mean, I was. 
The murder took place in the early hours of Friday, December the 12th. That weekend, police questioned many of the hospital staff who knew Yvonne, including Deborah Parry and Lucille for a second time. By the Monday, routine at the hospital was returning to normal. No longer restricted to the compound, Lucille, Deborah and Caroline Jinga made several trips into town over the next few days. On Thursday, the 19th of December, Lucille and Deborah again went into town first thing in the morning. And I was standing on the street and I'm, so I'm standing facing you and uh, a big modern bank called the Arab National Bank is beside me. And I recognised this man who came up to me and I thought it was one of the policemen and he just told me to get in the car. And he says to me, I asked him what was wrong and where I was going and I just got told to shut up or shut your mouth. And that was when the first pangs of sheer terror, I would say, is the word. The police had put Lucille, Deborah and Caroline under surveillance, alerted that the dead woman's bank card was being used. At the same time as Lucille's arrest at the bank, Deborah Parry was arrested, coming out of a shop. Later, Caroline Jinga, although never arrested, was brought from the King Fard Hospital to the police station by a senior policeman, Major Hamid, to help with their inquiries. And he turned around to me and said, Carolyn, you will not lie. If you lie, we will know. According to Lucille, once she was in the police station, the questioning focused not on the murder, but on the dead woman's bank card. The police alleged she'd been using it since the murder and had it in her handbag when she was arrested. He went outside the room and he came back in with my handbag, a small black handbag, and uh, he took out this load of cash. You know, it was, seemed a lot of money. It was in Saudi Reals. And a bank card, which I didn't know was Yvonne's at the time. And he says to me that I had taken 5,000 reals out of Yvonne's account, and that was a bank card and it was found in my bag. And I always remember him call, um, calling me a thief and a harlot. And that was the start. Basically, this, this to and fro between me and the police about, yeah, you will sign a confession, and me saying, no, I won't. Yeah, you will. Now, later on that evening, or in the afternoon at some point, I just couldn't hold on any longer. Now I was standing against this wall, surrounded by these policemen, and I actually wet myself, you know, in front of all these men, and I was very ashamed and very embarrassed about it, and I was frightened, and I wanted to speak to my mum or dad on the phone. I just wanted to speak to anybody who was, wasn't a Saudi. I then had got told and got help to take my black abaya off, my abaya, maybe off before that point, I'm not sure, but I certainly had to take my jogging pants off and my pants and my shoes. And I got sat down in a chair. And all I had on, if I can remember correctly, was a very small, flimsy T-shirt. And I had nothing on down below, and I had no bra on. And I honestly thought they were going to wait to rape me then. It was very obvious to me that a couple of the policemen were... You know, pe one of the questions, somebody, how do you know they were going to rape you? Well, all I can say to that is, it was very obvious to me that a couple of these policemen were sexually aroused. And they were enjoying what they were doing to me. And they enjoyed seeing somebody in the situation that I found myself in. And that just made the whole situation even worse for me. And they were touching me and slapping me and touching my breasts and touching me down below. To me, it seemed like hours and hours. I don't even know how long it was. What were you supposed to confess to? Initially, it was just theft. Just theft, you know, compared to, to murder. You know, I say just theft. Uh, so, how much were you using the bank card? Yeah. Yeah, just all you have to do, all you have to do is start writing, Lucy, I'll help you, I'll tell you what to write, and all you have to, and I'll all stop, everything will stop. Mm -hmm. 
you'll be home in a couple of weeks, we don't want you in our country, you can go home and nobody will care, nobody knows about what's going on and all you have to do is write. And they said it over and over and over and over again. It's a compelling account, but is Lucille telling the truth? Lucille McLaughlin, Deborah Parry and Caroline Jinger were interviewed in the Saudi police station in adjacent rooms. Caroline now questions why Lucille didn't react if she was subjected to such serious abuse as she claims. As I was in the middle room, I could hear muffled voices coming from either side. I never heard Lucy scream, I never heard her shout, I never heard her yell. Um, and I'm sure if there was something going on, I would have noted that. Um, I knew at one stage Debbie seemed a little bit angry. I did hear, hear her voice raised. That was later on in the afternoon. But I never heard Lucy's voice at all. And you could hear voices going all the time from next door. Whatever the truth in Lucille's claims to have been abused by the police and framed over Yvonne Guilford's bank card, by the early evening of the day of her arrest, she had signed a confession concerning Yvonne's murder. In her confession, Lucille stated that she'd been called by Yvonne Guilford that night and asked to arbitrate in a row with Deborah Parry over their lesbian relationship. The argument got out of control and Deborah first struck Yvonne with a kettle and then stabbed her with a kitchen knife, finally smothering her with a pillow. Lucille said she did nothing but helped Deborah to clean up. Lucille's confession went on to say that two days later, Deborah told her she had Yvonne's bank card and that on three consecutive days, they together withdrew a total of 15,000 Saudi rials from Yvonne's bank account. Whilst the police were questioning their suspects, a post-mortem examination was being carried out on the body we asked a leading British forensics expert to explain the Saudi doctor's report. Wounds are present on the front of a trunk, in the right breast, on the upper left abdomen, below the left, left breast, uh, on the neck, on the back, on the back of the loin, on the right leg. And there are also injuries on the head, mainly on the scalp. There are two deep wounds in the chest, one going through from the back into the left chest to pierce the heart, a second going in from the front through the right breast into the right lung, and there's a third at the junction between the chest and the abdomen on the left side, on the front of the body, where the liver and spleen has been damaged. And obviously in that instance, the knife has gone in, partly withdrawn, and then back in again. Pattern suggests She's been in a fight. It's been a struggle. How and why Yvonne Guilford was so brutally murdered was the subject of Lucille McLaughlin's confession on the day of her arrest. In this, she implicated Deborah Parry, but she now claims that the police had told her that Deborah had already confessed herself. So they were telling you this? Yeah, yeah. Major Hammond was telling me that yeah. Debbie had confessed. Yeah. She said that you basically told the police that she had committed the murder. That's, that's it, isn't it? I certainly wrote that down. I certainly wrote that down, but I certainly at never at any point of that investigation did I freely give that information of my own accord. At no time did I ever do that. At no time. You know, they were telling me Debbie was saying this and saying that and she stabbed her here and she hurt her with a teapot or a kettle here and how does she know all that if she didn't Excuse me, if she didn't do it, you know, she must have done it. But had Deborah already confessed? Because next, the police instructed Lucille to confront Deborah with the very information that she was supposed to have confessed to. I'd been told that I was going to be taken through to where Debbie was, and all I had to say was that Debbie was a lesbian, and that, I think, what was that? I can't remember, Debbie was a lesbian, and that she stabbed her in the chest, neck, and back. I think that's what it was. And all I had to do was say that. I wasn't allowed to talk to Debbie or say anything to her apart from that. And that if I, uh, if I was good and done what I was told, everything would be okay and we'll just come back into this room and we won't touch you, Lucy. If you don't do what you're told, your clothes are back off and we'll 
finish off basically what we said we were going to do. So I did it. Lucille's account is challenged by investigative journalist John Ware. He spent over two years examining the case. He believes Deborah Parry is innocent and has his own explanation for why Lucille pointed the finger at Deborah. I think that uh, she confessed as quickly as she did because she knew she was up a gum tree. She had been caught in possession of this card. She did a deal. She spotted the opportunity, whether presented by the police or offered by hers, who know, by her, who knows. But the fact is, she spotted that opportunity to shift the blame very rapidly onto Deborah. The record shows that it was a further three days of interrogation before Deborah Parry also confessed. Deborah's confession was clearly at odds with Lucille's. Whilst Deborah admitted stabbing Yvonne, as Lucille had alleged, she said that she did it in self-defense. She said the pillow smothering was accidental. Deborah denied that she knew anything about the bank card. The next day, both women wrote two new confessions which were more consistent with each other. The confessions stated that although Deborah took responsibility for the stabbing, Lucille now admitted that she did the smothering. Lucille also now conceded she took the bank card. But of course, she still emerges with a confession which um, is terribly favorable to her, Lucille, and, you know, desperately damaging to Deborah. Even at the end of it, we still have Deborah having committed first degree murder, supposedly. Uh, and all we have from Lucille is stealing the card. And the most that Lucille admits to is using a pillow to, almost as an act of mercy, to put Yvonne out of her suffering. That's the way she puts it. Um, the lethal blows having been struck by, by Deborah. So all the time, Lucy is looking to minimize her position. It's all about damage limitation. It's all about the best deal she can craft for her. Debbie wants people to believe that not only did I willfully implicate her in the murder, that I then got the Daharam police to come on side with me. I mean, that's, that's quite far-fetched and outrageous to, to suggest that, but, you know, that's what she's actually saying publicly, that she only signed a confession because I did, and I told her to. I mean, I'm sorry, that's not true. It's not true. These final confessions formed the basis for the nurse's subsequent convictions. But how reliable are they? The author of a book on the case, published in Australia, is investigative writer Mick O'Donnell. They were put together over days, weeks perhaps, with various additions, uh, prompted by the police, quite obviously, uh, and without a lawyer for either side present, without a, a, a diplomatic representative being present, uh, and done by women who were obviously terrified, and perhaps being told that they, they could go home if they just signed up. That does not make the confessions untrue in their essence. It doesn't mean that the women are innocent. The Western concept of justice differs from the Sharia law, which is based on the Quran. The Saudi system is so focused on confession. In a way, it's a kind of uh, emotional system because the judges in Saudi Arabia will not actually proceed with a criminal case unless there is a confession. Now, in the Western system, you need never speak against yourself. You need never give an, a, an account of what happened uh, against yourself in court. In this case, no physical evidence was brought to court. No witnesses were brought to court. All that uh, the judges were looking at, at least in the open, in the court, were the confessions. There is a tradition in Sharia and Islam of forgiveness to where if somebody committed a crime and they come to court or they come to the police or they come to the decider of all things, the head of the tribe or the head of the country, and they say, you know, I, I have wronged you or I have done wrong, 
I confess and I ask forgiveness. This matters a great deal. You know, the idea of repentance is part and parcel of Islam. On the morning of the 23rd of December, the two British nurses confirmed before a Saudi judge that their confessions were true. The nurses were finally allowed contact with people from the British Embassy. At this stage, they said nothing about ill treatment by the police. Hamid had warned me and warned me and warned me, don't say anything, don't tell. So I didn't. And they were there. All the policemen were there. The next visit by a man called Tim Lam, which is about the 29th or 30th of December, this is a few days later, there was only Tim and one policeman and me. And I thought, right, just, Lucy, you just can't do this. I think the realisation of what I'd done in signing this confession, you know, in the situation I now found myself in was just starting to sink in. You know, this is murder, this is not... This isn't just theft, this is murder. You're in a lot, a lot of trouble, Lucy. At this meeting with the British consul, Tim Lamb, both nurses said they wanted to retract their confessions, denying any involvement in the murder of Yvonne Guilford, the theft and use of her bank card, and any lesbian relationship, a position that they continue to maintain to this day. The embassy contacted the legal firm of Al Hajjalan to assist in their defence. The issue of retracting their confession was made clear to us at the time and uh, the girls have uh, mentioned that to my law firm uh, and they were uh, th there was a good meeting from the from the uh, client lawyer relationship at the time it was quite adequate and uh, there hasn't been any uh, symptoms or indication at the time that there was a certain torture on them by the police as it was alleged later on. Well, I only met Mr. Hajalan once and the whole time I was there. The, the, the main person I dealt with was a man called Mike Dark. He was a, a nice man. I didn't tell him exactly what happened to me the first couple of occasions I met him. I mean, I didn't. I told him that I'd had my clothes and that taken off. I didn't go into any graphic detail about it because I just couldn't. I just couldn't tell this man who was a stranger. And the first time Mike came to see us, Major Hamid was present, and so were three Saudi nationals who worked for, you know, Salah's law firm. So here you are again, surrounded by men, and they're wanting to know why you signed it. You know, I, I just couldn't tell them. I wish I did. I would have made it easier, certainly easier for me now. But I didn't. Uh, the, the, the doctor who examined them immediately after the confession uh, were, were written uh, did not indicate any of this on their body. Uh, but I'm sure because of uh, the fact that they were in the custody of the police for a number of days uh, with lack of sleep, with difficulty in language, uh, although there was an interpreter there, uh, the fact they are women, they just arrived to the country in September. Uh, all of those factors, beside uh, they were anxious to be deported, uh, have led them to perhaps uh, be a little agitated and uh, felt threatened uh, by the police. There was no marks and they're quite correct, there wasn't. But this is 11 days after my arrest. I was checked by a doctor, 11 days. Lucille has always claimed that most of the police mistreatment happened on the first day of her questioning. But Caroline Jinga, who was in the room next to her for that entire day, remains sceptical. When I left the police station on the Thursday night at one o'clock in the morning, after being there for 13 hours, and I saw Lucy McLaughlin sitting in the room, she didn't once tell me to get the embassy. She didn't once cry out for help. So what you're saying is that she could have shouted out. They've Absolutely. Tried, they've tried to rape me or get the embassy. Absolutely. Or... Absolutely. No justice system is immune from abuse. Although he's a leading critic of the Saudi system, writer Saeed Abarish doubts the allegations of police mistreatment in this case. On analysis, I think it is most unlikely that the Saudi police forced a confession on these women. 
The number one consideration here is that there were women, there were females, and the Saudi police is loath to put pressure on them as they would with males. Um, this is for their own protection because religiously they are not supposed to really handle women. And so they would naturally shy away from that. Uh, this is one element. The second element is their citizenship. There is no one in Saudi Arabia, even the lowliest officer in the police force, who does not know that good relations exist between Saudi Arabia and the United Kingdom, and that the United Kingdom is indeed in the business of protecting its own citizens. Why did they want to, in a sense, frame you? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know why. The only person who could answer that question is the Saudi police. Once the, when I got arrested and it was made aware to me that Major Hamid was aware of the theft allegation in Scotland, it's very easy to say I went to Saudi and did exactly the same thing. Who's going to believe me to a Saudi policeman? He knew I would have not one single shred of credibility and that's exactly what's happened. That's exactly what's happened. The main problem if Hudson's coming home is not even defending myself about Yvonne's murder. It's been Yvonne's bank card. It's, it's the bank card constantly with me. And he knew that. He must have known that. He must have known. He definitely knew on the 19th of December when I was arrested that I'd been accused of theft in Scotland. I checked with Tayside Police. I checked with the head of uh, CID there. And he assured me categorically there had been no communication, whatever, in any shape or form, either directly from the Saudis or through Interpol, about Lucille McLaughlin. So I'm sceptical that the Saudis knew anything about her uh, impending uh, theft charge. Uh, and I think she used that um, as a means of getting people to believe that she was fitted up. So was Lucille McLaughlin fitted up by the Saudi police, or was she caught red-handed with Yvonne Guilford's bank card? After Yvonne Guilford was brutally murdered, her bank card continued to be used. Did Lucille McLaughlin use this card? How did she get the card? How it was planted in her purse, as, as she says? Uh, what is this transfer of money? Uh, how much was it? Uh, how did she collect that kind of cash, about maybe close to 3,000 pounds or... Uh, I think she should answer all of those questions. Uh, she did not answer them to the court. We investigated the financial transactions on Yvonne Guilford's bank card over four crucial days. There are many coincidences. The story begins on Monday the 16th of December three days after the murder. We weren't allowed off the compound grounds initially for the first couple of days. Um, so we, finally on the Monday we got permission to leave and Lucy and I had collected our paychecks in the afternoon and we had decided that we would go out for dinner considering we both hadn't been eating very well. Um, so then what we, we decided to do was to go down to town and cash our paychecks. Lucille has a different explanation for this first trip to the bank. She says she went there with Caroline not to cash her salary cheque, but to transfer to Scotland a stash of her own money. I had about two, just over £2,000 with me that I brought from the UK. You know, a lot of people have said to me, why did you have all that money with you? I mean, I would have had to get a flight home very quickly if I had to go to court. And also, if anything happens to your family, when you're in Saudi or you've got to come home in an emergency that the hospital don't pay for that. It's really quite stupid to go out to Saudi for a year without any money, you know what I mean? So I did have this money. So I decided that rather than lose the money or have it stolen by somebody, which seemed to be the motive, maybe if this is what maybe happened to Yvonne, was that I would send it back to my, to my fiance. So this was £2,000 in cash? Yeah. In Sterling? In dollars. In dollars. dollars as well. And you kept it in your apartment? Hidden it, yeah. Well, the, the word that we used to call it was it was your stash. It was money you had stashed away. It was just your stash. What stash 
She didn't tell me, oh, well, she could have had a stash. She didn't tell me that she had a stash, but then I'm not interested in everyone's banking. I'm only interested in my own. You thought she was transferring her salary? She told me she was transferring her salary. Lucille maintains it was her stash and not her salary she was sending home. And I telex that money back to my husband, to my husband's account in Dundee on the Monday the 16th of December. This is four days after Yvonne's murder. And this is also the first day that the Saudi police state that I, well, myself and Debbie, started using Yvonne's bank card. You know, it's just outrageous to... It doesn't make any sense to do that. If I was going to steal money and send it back to the UK, I certainly wouldn't have had a colleague with us when I'd done it. I certainly wouldn't have waited four days. Why wait four days to use Yvonne's bank card if I did in fact have it? I knew I was under suspicion. I'd been questioned by the Saudi police. I got told the question wasn't over. There would be more questions. And, you know, it was just sheer madness to do that, to use Yvonne's bank card, whether I had it or not. Lucille certainly did transfer 12,000 rials, which was £1,900, and sent it to her fiancé in Scotland, as the bank form shows. Was this her stash, as she claims, or was it her salary of 6,200 rials, topped up with extra cash? A sum of 5,000 rials was, coincidentally, withdrawn from Yvonne Guilford's bank account at the same bank at the same time as Lucille was making her transfer. After her bank transactions, Lucille went shopping with Caroline and they then had a meal. When we came out of the Chinese restaurant, Lucy said to me that um, she needed to withdraw some more money um, because she felt that she had sent too much money home to her fiancé. Then I thought of the Arab National Bank. I knew that they had ATM machines and that's what Lucy wanted. When we told Lucille what Caroline said, she denied that she'd been to the Arab National Bank with Caroline after supper. Yet, coincidentally, there were three attempted withdrawals using Yvonne Guilford's bank card from the Arab National Bank at 7.34 that evening. No cash was paid out. The card had already reached its daily limit. The next day, Tuesday the 17th of December, Lucille went shopping with Deborah Parry and Caroline Jinger. And we went to a place called the Al Rashid Mall. And I did buy clothes out of next a pair of trousers and a top, and I did buy some makeup. And I think approximately it came to about two hundred pounds. At the time that Lucille was shopping in the Al Rashid Mall, bank records show that five thousand rials was withdrawn from Yvonne Guilford's account via a bank machine located in the mall. Wednesday, the eighteenth of December. And we went into town. Basically, me and Debbie cashed for salary checks in a bank called the Saudi Hollandi Bank in Al Kobar. And I telex money back to the to my own account, my money, you know, my salary money back to the UK. You've got the bank statements that'll prove that. She has cashed her paycheck Monday the 16th. And that's a fact. She lined up in front of me and cashed her check at the Saudi Hollandi Bank. And I cashed mine directly after hers. So you stood there, you saw her with her cheque? That's absolutely correct. Yes, I did. I was behind her, and once she had finished her transaction, I went to the same teller. And he knows us from, K, from King Fahd. And uh, he, it was a paycheck, I know that. I know it was her paycheck. When we put Caroline's statement to her, Lucille still maintained that she sent her stash home on the Monday and cashed her salary check on the Wednesday. But the coincidence is amounting. Even if she's right about her salary, on the Wednesday, Lucille did make a transfer at the Saudi Hollandai Bank of 1,100 pounds, 7,000 rials, which was around 1,000 rials more than her salary, and she sent it to her bank in Scotland. Where did the extra money come from? Bank records show that at the same time, at the same bank, 5,000 rials was withdrawn from Yvonne Guilford's account. Were you using a card? I did have 
I had my own, I've got two credit cards, you've got the receipts there, I had a, a MasterCard and a Visa card, and I did use them a period of time in Saudi, and you can use them, you know, as long as you had a PIN number, I had a PIN number for both of them, and you can use them. The only time I can remember trying to use my credit card was the Monday the 16th, to see, to try and get an account balance, which I don't think I got, and it was in the Al Rashid Mall, and the bank was closed. And I remember because it was prayer time. Everything closes at prayer time. So, but I certainly never used any bank card at all on Wednesday the 18th of December or Thursday the 19th of December, the day of my arrest. I did not use a bank card, any bank card, not my own and definitely not Yvonne Guilford's. Thursday the 19th of December, Lucille finished her night shift at seven o'clock in the morning and met up with Deborah. We went out to the front, up to the main gate, and we got a taxi. Now, I'm not exactly sure what time it was, but it was early in the morning. Lucille claims that she was standing outside the Arab National Bank when she was arrested, but the bank manager gave a statement to her defence lawyer that contradicts her story. He said the police had told him they'd been tracking the use of Yvonne Guilford's card for several days. That morning, he witnessed Lucille withdraw money from his bank's machine and then attempt to telex it abroad. When challenged, Lucille produced a card not in her name, saying it belonged to a friend. This was Yvonne Guilford's card. The bank manager stated he then called the police and Lucille was arrested. So that's absolutely untrue? Yes, yeah, untrue. I was not in this gentleman's bank, definitely not. Not on Thursday the 19th of December. I don't think I was ever in the bank, but certainly not on uh, Thursday the 19th of December, no. And you know, even he, he, he's making the phone call and the police, what, you know, that's obviously a very quick phone call he made then. You know, he, his statement's not consistent. The statement is not consistent. And I certainly was not in his bank. How did he know what I looked like? You know, he said that, you know, the police had been at Why would the police get in touch with him at that specific bank before I was actually meant to have used Yvonne's bank card inside it? It's not logical. You know, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. But the bank's records undermine Lucille's denials. They show that there was a withdrawal of 5,000 rials from Yvonne Guilford's account at 8.39 a.m. on the 19th of December shortly before the time of her arrest. You can't prove that you weren't in the bank. No. I don't think they can prove I was. They can't prove I was. That's as simple as that, because I wasn't in the bank. Since filming her interview, we've obtained new evidence. An Arab National Bank transfer form in Lucille McLaughlin's writing, dated the 19th of December. It shows her Scottish bank account details. The form was never completed. We put this evidence to Lucille and she faxed her response. She denied it proved she was in the bank. She admitted, what I cannot answer or explain is the date on the form. I don't have a reply for that. The evidence from the bank manager and the police weighed heavily on Lucille in her first meetings with lawyer Michael Dark in preparing her defence against the murder charge. We actually discussed for a short period of time of me actually pleading guilty to having Yvonne's bank card in Saudi. Basically to Mike thought that the court would accept that. You know, you go through all these different scenarios and Mike Dart promised he'd always be completely honest with me and give me the best advice that he thought. And his advice at that time was, would you consider pleading guilty to the bank card, Lucy, because he was worried, it was the murder that Mike was worried about. He, although to me, the bank card was devastating, you know what I mean? To Mike, the bank card peeled into insignificance compared to Yvonne's murder. And he thought that the court may accept that I did have Yvonne's bank card, but I did had nothing to do with the murder. You know, but anyway, I thought about it and I thought, no, I'm not pleading guilty of something I didn't do. If Lucille did use Yvonne Guilford's card, how did she get her PIN number? Lucy and I were having a discussion. Um, I can't tell you exactly when it was, but it was after the murder. 
and as we were having many discussions about Yvonne and life, um, she had told me that uh, Yvonne had asked her to withdraw some money from Yvonne's bank account for Yvonne. This would have been up to two weeks prior to her murder. So Lucy had taken Yvonne's card, pin number, to the bank and withdrawn some money. I can't tell you how much or where it was done. All I can remember was Lucy disclosing that to me. When we asked Lucille if she ever went to the bank for Yvonne, as Caroline says, she faxed her denial. She said, this is completely untrue. I think that Lucille um, did have the uh, cash card of the murdered woman, Yvonne Guilford. Uh, and that raises a very obvious question. How did she get it? Uh, it doesn't, of course, make her a murderer. <clears throat> it would be unfair to accuse her of being a murderer. But she has not yet given a satisfactory answer, in my view. It had nothing to do with her death, and I had nothing to do with the alleged theft of Yvonne's bank cards. I never, ever had Yvonne's bank card before or after her murder. I didn't have it. So you're completely innocent? Yes, I am. Unfortunately, in this case, there isn't, apparently, a smoking gun. We don't have fingerprints on the murder weapon. We don't have a lot of fingerprints scattered around the room where this frenzied murder took place. I don't believe that either of these women would have been convicted in a Western court on the evidence to date, because there are so many inconsistencies in the confessions, and the witnesses have circumstantial evidence and can describe the behaviour of the women. But it's all very circumstantial and it's, and it's not perhaps finally persuasive beyond reasonable doubt. Lucille McLaughlin and Deborah Parry returned to the UK in May 1998, proclaimed their innocence and sold their stories to the press for six-figure sums. Lucille returned to Dundee and faced prosecution for the charges brought two years earlier. On legal advice, Lucille refused to discuss this case in our interview with her. When she was the staff nurse in charge of the night ward at Dundee's King's Cross Hospital, she was accused of the theft of the bank card of an elderly patient and then taking nearly £2,000 from her account. She was also charged with forging her references to obtain her job in Saudi. Throughout her three-day trial in December 1998, her counsel argued for her innocence, but Lucille was found guilty of forging the references, handling the stolen card, and, caught on camera by the bank's video machine, of stealing £300 from the patient's account. At the sentencing hearing in January, her lawyer admitted on Lucille's behalf that she was guilty of the charges on which she had been convicted and pleaded with the sheriff not to send her to prison. Lucille was then sentenced to return the £300 and to 240 hours of community service. It was the theft of the bank card in Dundee that took Lucille McLaughlin to Saudi Arabia in the first place. Here there was another bank card, but this was the card of Yvonne Guilford. Yvonne was violently stabbed to death. Her family and friends have to live with this horror for the rest of their lives. Lucille McLaughlin and Deborah Parry both continue to proclaim their innocence. <laughs>